Twilight Syndrome. It's an incredibly intriguing series of games that stars young high schoolers as they investigate rumors of paranormal phenomenon like young people do in real life, and the rumors are often based on real life urban legends. And to make things really interesting, the cases that these young people investigate often somehow make them realize things about themselves or involve themselves in some kind of way. And these games are incredibly well told stories that, unlike a lot of other horror games, really nail tension. These games can build up to a confrontation like it's nobody's business, to the point that there's rarely, if, any, if ever, any actual supernatural phenomenon appearing on screen. But you feel it, you are right there with the people investigating. And as they get more and more tense, so do you. And that's an incredible feat for games that are just glorified walking simulators. And just experiencing them is an event and an incredibly immersive one. I've previously explained the plot of the first game, and if you haven't watched that yet, please go do that, as the sequel picks up seconds after the ending of the first game. But if you have watched that first series, then please sit back and relax, and let me for probably the first time in English, take you on a journey through Twilight Syndrome Kiyomi Hen, aka Investigation. After Mika vanishes into thin air, Yukari and Chisato head back to the library to see if they can figure out how to get to where Mika is. And through their research and with a little help from a teacher, they learn of a portal to enter the Hanashiro Grove. And they make their way to the portal and they enter. And they find themselves in some kind of strange forest that feels strangely old. And they begin to wander around and look for any signs of where Mika could be. Chisato and Yukari come across a shrine and realize it is an important one. Chisato convinces Yukari to go inside and here they find Sakura's journal and learn that the strange way that she referred to her mother and her sister dying was suicide and that it was kind of like a ritualistic suicide as they were as she is, maidens of Hanashiro. The story goes that a young girl was sacrificed so that another girl could be cured of her illness. But the sacrificed girl tainted the river and so a tradition was started where women of a certain bloodline would be sacrificed when they came of age to reverse the taint. A ritual sacrifice to stave off the destruction brought upon by a ritual sacrifice. As the girls conclude their reading, they see Sakura and Mika through the window in the shrine. They yell out to Mika and she hears them and tells Sakura that she has to go. The window they see through isn't a window really, it's more like a portal and Mika isn't on the other side but somewhere else, but they do have some sort of power to read through and at least communicate with her. Sakura tries to convince Mika to stay and says that if she leaves, the spirits and the river will be angry. Yukari begins yelling at Mika and realizes that pleading doesn't work. She has to be her authentic Yukari self and she yells to Mika that she has to come back or she won't ever get to hang out with him again. Which does seem to work as Mika begins to respond to Yukari. Yukari's yelling manages to get through to Sakura as well and in the end she's the one that actually convinces Mika to leave as she realizes that she loot her here because she was lonely, not for Mika's sake as she originally convinced herself. Because Mika came here of her own free will and that Sakura learned to let go of her, she and the other maidens are allowed to pass on, and as they do, the grove collapses and the humans present, Mika, Chisato and Yukari, find themselves back at the shrine on the mountain in the real world. Mika. 
Some time after, Chisato and Yukari are discussing Mika and how weird it is that she seems to be back to normal. Mika walks up to them and it's obvious that she has a rumor she wants to investigate and the others can't quite wrap their head around her wanting to do that again also quickly after that last thing. Mika asks if Yukari is reluctant because she's worried about her, which flusters Yukari and she and Shisato then walks away. Mika remains for just a moment and hears a voice in the wind say her name and then farewell. Kitamura is breaking up with Yukari and he's blaming it on the situation with the music teacher and his student that we investigated in the second rumor in the first game. He says that it's not forever, only until they no longer have to pretend. Ew. Meanwhile, two people are discussing a recent suicide at school. The kid was bullied and went nuts and then killed himself, a kid named KT and later on at a school assembly all of the students are informed of this. Not long after, KT is spotted in the school's equipment locker and this naturally catches the attention of the Syndrome Trio, which was what Mika wanted to talk about in the previous chapter. Yukari doesn't want to investigate it out of fear of the ghost being angry, but Mika and Chisato manages to convince her anyways. <laughs> Rumor has it that he appears at dusk, so they meet back up at the school shortly before that. They get to the locker room and decide to put on gym shoes before entering, as they don't want to get in trouble should anyone see them in the gym with outdoor shoes on. As they look for shoes, one of the lockers opens up by its own, but it's nothing. Not finding any ghosts in the gym itself, they make their way towards the equipment locker and on their way there, they do see something weird just before they enter and inside they see him in the dusk glow of a window. Yukari doesn't know how to talk to a ghost, so she has Mika ask him if he's KT, and she does, and then he just disappeared. And the trio decides to call it a night. The next day they meet up between periods and talk about what just happened. KT was apparently bullied by primarily two students, who both beat him and extorted him for money. Yukari doesn't think that that's a fucked up enough reason for anyone to turn into a ghost, so she thinks they should investigate and they go around school and ask people about KT and the bullies and the incidents. One girl explains that he didn't seem to mind getting beaten up, like it didn't bother him. Another says that the two primary bullies treated him like a slave, but that he just laughed at it, like he seemed to enjoy it. And another boy doesn't understand how he even killed himself when he seemed so lifeless to begin with, and like Yukari, doesn't understand why he turned into a ghost either. With no other leads, they confront one of the bullies, but he denies everything, which doesn't help them at all. Having become none the wiser, they decide to go and head back to the gym at dusk and talk to KT and see if he will communicate with them this time. On the way to the equipment room, they spot a ball, but when they try and pick it up and put it back in its place, it just rolls away. They attempt to contact KT again, and the whole room begins to shake, and then he appears, and this time, he does talk. The girls introduce themselves, and KT apparently recognizes Mika. They ask him why he's here as a ghost, and he's very confused and doesn't seem to realize that he was one up until now, and they follow up by asking him if he's holding a grudge, which makes him very angry. He's only wearing a single gym shoe, and they ask him about that, and he responds that he lost it. They ask about his bullying, and he says that he gets along with the bullies fine, and is very insistent about it before fading away again. Chisato believes that they are a little responsible for not trying to help him while he was alive, but Yukari doesn't agree, and thinks that they should ne never have gotten involved in the first place. Sometimes later, we hear someone playing ball in a gym, and then a lamp falls down, and a scream is heard. Mikai calls up Yukari and tells her that it was one of the bullies, and that he got hurt really badly. 
not buying the whole official explanation that it was just metal fatigue that made the lamp fall down, and not wanting to wait for anyone else to get hurt, including themselves, if he manages to make it that far down his revenge list, the girls go and confront KT again. First, Mika is sent off to the hospital to ask the victim what happened, as the bully that got hurt happens to have a crush on her, like a lot of boys do at the school. The bully Kurata initially plays dumb about the whole ghost thing, but Mika tricks him into saying his name, confirming that he knows who he is, and accidentally alluding to the fact that he saw him when the lamp fell, or at least that he felt him like he was haunting the gym. Kurata insists that he and Saeki, the other bully, were friends with KT and says that if Mika doesn't believe him, she can just go ask KT's parents, as the three of them had sleepovers over there. When Mika is telling the rest of the group what happened, Chisato suggests that they go talk to the parents, just to see if they were actually friends in some kind of like perverse way. The mother is very angry at the school and doesn't understand how they would let the bullying go so far. She does confirm that the bullies did spend time at the house, and that KT called them friends, and she didn't notice any bullying from the two of them. She blames the school for not noticing the same thing that she also didn't notice, because she doesn't want to. She doesn't want to admit that her son was being bullied, and like everyone else, she pretended not to notice, just like the bullies, just like KT himself. Yukari makes that point, and it leaves the mother absolutely speechless. She then feebly attempts to defend herself before giving up and just telling the trio to leave. Yukari wants nothing to do more with the case and says that she is out because she doesn't want to end up like Kurata. Chisato responds that she doesn't understand because she's too strong of a person. She could never understand how someone could be trapped like that, how someone could try and try and escape such a situation but fail every time because they just aren't strong enough to separate themselves from things that hurt them, because it also brings them a little joy. And they rather live with a lot of hurt and a little love than none of either. Yukari doesn't understand this, because she has never been in that situation, and she never will. She will never allow anything like that to happen to her. Jisato and Mika then go alone to the equipment room one more time, in one final attempt to calm the spirit down. He doesn't appear though when they call him, but as they are about to give up and are about to leave, he finally does. They ask about the accident, but KT denies that it was him. They keep pushing and pushing and he keeps denying and denying, but gets more and more angry before finally, unlike during his lifetime, he finally accepts the truth and his own small complicity in what happened to him. The mental contact with the ghostly KT triggers something in Chisato, and she gets a vision, a flashback of what happened, and we learn that there was a third bully, a ringleader. And during the events leading up to the suicide, KT was supposed to bring him money, so that they could all go show some girls from a rival high school a very good time, but he didn't bring it. He didn't want to party right before a big basketball match, as he really loved basketball. The bullies didn't take this kindly, and they beat him very badly and taunted him, telling him to kill himself, telling them that he was worthless, and that he had to come up with the money so that they could all show the girls from that other high school a really good time, or else. Chisato now understands, and despite being weak from receiving the vision she just received, she decides to go back one final time and get the full truth. Yukari confronts Seiki, one of the bullies, about the whole thing, and informs him that she know they pretended to be KT's friends so that they could extort money from him and what they did in that equipment room. Yukari keeps tearing into Seiki until he finally caves and admits that he feels guilty, admits that he know he was a shithead, admits that he in his own twisted way appreciated KT. The Syndrome Trio decides to confront KT in the gym for a final time and plead with him to tell them the truth, even though it might be painful to admit. He finally caves and says that he doesn't understand why they do it, why they hurt others and extort money from them, and then he just asks for his other gym shoe. He finally understands how bad his life was and then he just fades away. The trio go looking for the gym shoe, knowing that it will finally put him back to rest for good. 
They find it outside and return the shoot to the locker that opened by itself in the beginning of the search, not really knowing what else to do. Following the events, Chisato took a break from school for just a little while, and when she did return, she acted like nothing had happened, just like Mika. KT's parents decided to sue the school, and the school started an investigation. The bullies confessed their wrongdoing, and the hungry tabloids and even the school itself was almost disappointed that the events that led to his suicide weren't more dramatic than bullying and a lack of intervening. <laughs> 